There we go. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Papa, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank you and the organizing committee for the invitation for this very important um, symposium. Um, uh, so I will be here today talking about point of care uh, Utelson for ma airway management. Uh, sorry, just a second, let me, there we go. And uh, as my conflict of interest disclosure, I just want to <clears throat> inform <clears throat> that I was granted with the 2022 Society of Airway Management Research Award. In, um, in a study that were performing in a related area with the presentation. <clears throat> so <clears throat> as learning objectives, uh, we're going to discuss uh, airway focus for four main points, identification of the cricothyroid membrane, <clears throat> confirmation of endotracheal intubation, ultrasound-guided percutaneous tracheostomy, and the ability to predict difficult airway with airway ultrasound. <clears throat> so the first topic, identification of the cricothyroid membrane. <clears throat> and I would say that the point of start for growing interest with that was <clears throat> once um, the airway guidelines start to make it pathway a little bit short, shorter, uh, shorter to, to reach front of neck access. <clears throat> this is the <clears throat> Difficult Airway Society guideline that was published in 2015. As you can see, the plan D that's uh, emerging front of neck access when you reach a situation of cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate is much closer to your uh, first plan, that's plan A. If you compare with uh, other guidelines that were published before that, notably <clears throat> the ASA, American Society of Anesthesiologists guidelines. Another point that uh, these uh, guidelines highlighted that precothyroidotomy would be the, the, the technique, of, technique of choice for front of neck access. <clears throat> so once these start to be established, there was more interested, more interest in studying uh, the cricothyroidotomy and studying as well <clears throat> how to find the cricothyroid membrane. <clears throat> so first, a few studies were published about uh, the, at that point, the common sense technique that was identifying the cricothyroid membrane by palpation. So you can see on this slide on the top and on the right uh, bottom, <clears throat> Two studies that uh, uh, look into what, or what was the accuracy of uh, palpation of the neck landmarks and the cricothyroid membrane. And they show that amongst uh, several professionals in different specialties, like anesthesiologists, <clears throat> uh, emerging department physicians, and trauma surgeons, the accuracy was only around 50%. And one study for our, from our group that our group that signed it that you can see at the bottom left, uh, in in even like a specific populations like obese women parturients in labor, uh, this uh, accuracy could go as low as thirty nine percent. At this point, uh, people got interested as well. What other uh, devices we could use to, to help on this subject. And in 2015, Dr. Christensen from Denmark and Dr. Teo from Singapore, they published this, they published this article uh, uh, highlighting all the details about the ultrasonographic identification of the cricothyroid membrane. <clears throat> and after that, uh, more interest in research about using ultrasound for identification of the cricothyroid membrane start to show up. And then we have like uh, at our site, we, we had several studies about this subject and we are able to not only show that ultrasound was uh, superior 
to the palpation technique for defining the cricotyl membrane in patients with uh, poorly defined necklace landmarks, but also that using ultrasound will make it uh, easier uh, to perform cricotyrodotomy. <clears throat> Uh, so just to show you guys the, the technique for, for identifying the cricotyl membrane for, uh, by ultrasound, here we have a neck of a, a person, and then we have a draw of the uh, structures of interest. And you can see that the, the structure with the letter C is the thyroid membrane. You have the cricoid cartilage with the letter E, and in between, you have on lever, uh, sorry, letter D, the cricothyroid membrane. So this is what we want to find. <clears throat> and here I can, I, I'm going to show you there are two approaches that we can use for identifying the cricothyroid membrane by uterus. And we have the transverse and the longitudinal, longitudinal approach. The transverse is always also called TACA. And I'm going to explain why, why is that. And the the longitudinal is called the uh, strings of pearls. <clears throat> uh, so this is the TACA technique. <clears throat> the first, the, 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 the upper line, you can see the thyroid cartilage. So on the left, you can, you can see the probe on the neck of a patient. In the middle, you can see the ultrasonographic image. In the right, you have like uh, the structures highlighted by a blue, <clears throat> blue uh, lines. So you can see at the, at the top that you have the thyroid that's a, a structure in a V, inverted V shape. <clears throat> when you scroll down a little bit your, your, your probe, you're going to see like a small um, um, bright line that's actually air interface when you reach your cricothyroid membrane. So we have like <clears throat> a very bright line, a small bright line. Then once you, uh, push your probe a little bit lower on your neck, you're going to start to see a structure that's in form of a C, and this is your cricoid cartilage. Once you have this image, you know that you pass already your cricothyroid membrane. So then you can go up again on your probe and find the second image again, and then you know that you're in the, the, the correct level for the cricothyroid membrane. <clears throat> For this approach, sometimes it's a little bit challenging to find the structure. So if you're having difficulty, you can just go to your uh, suprasternal notch and then place the probe there, find the trachea first, and then you go up and find the other structures. <clears throat> the other approach would be uh, the longitudinal pro approach or uh, uh, the longitudinal approach. And then in here, you start from the sternal notch, you find the trachea, you move your probe to the side as you would be cutting your trachea. So you can see this on the second line. The trachea is the, the, the big uh, rounded uh, shadow in the upper line, but in the second line, you go and move your probe and then you cut your trachea in half and then you turn your probe 90 degrees. <clears throat> and then you should see this image on the third line when you have several small rounded structures that are hypercoic, so they are black, and these are the tracheal rings. Just below the tracheal rings, you're going to have a bright line again. That's just the air interface that you have from the air in the trachea. <clears throat> Once you find this image, <clears throat> uh, you can just uh, move your probe a little bit cephalic, and then in after a little bit of movement, you're going to find a big rounded structure that you can see at the bottom line as the um, highlighted in, in green. And as you move the probe a little bit, and this structure will be a little bit higher on your image, and this will be the cricoid cartilage. <clears throat> then if you move a little bit higher, you're going to have another bigger structure, similar size of the cricoid, that would be uh, the thyroid cartilage. And this is highlighted by the purple <clears throat> circle on the last line. And between these two structures, you're going to have the cricothyroid membrane. You can use uh, <clears throat> a needle, it can be an epidural needle or like a, an IV catheter needle, <clears throat> and then create a shadow 
to make sure that you are into the cryotile membrane and you can mark after you remove your probe, mark your cryotile membrane. <clears throat> so we have two techniques. In general, the longitudinal technique is, is, is more accurate, but uh, it's ideal to have proficiency in both because there are a few situations that you're not going to be able to use the longitudinal one. And that will be when you have a really short neck this might be a, a, a problem. <clears throat> uh, and the other situation will be if you have a little bit like of your, your midline distorted from the center, you might be difficult to find in the longitudinal approach. So in this situation, the TACA, that stands for thyroid air, cricoid air, the TACA the, uh, um, approach will be the best one to use. <clears throat> so once the technique was described, and I just described it for you guys here as well. Is it difficult to learn? So another study from our group at Sinai, um, we are able to, to evaluate it, how uh, trainees will, will do trying to identify the cricotile membrane after two hours of training. <clears throat> and actually, our group find that uh, they, are, they were able to achieve competency after only 20 attempts <clears throat> and they were able to keep these competencies after three months and of note for this study after uh, the mean time for finding the critical time memory was around 36 seconds uh, just after they train the first time <clears throat> however <clears throat> after this uh, primary study showing that the 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 identification of the cricotile membrane by ultrasound was more accurate than that by palpation. <clears throat> more studies show that the time to, for this identification will be around <clears throat> 30 seconds and some studies up to 60 seconds. So we start to have a conversation and discussion among the among area experts this, is this feasible when you have like a situation that you have a can't intubate, can't oxygenate situation when you are passing from the plan C to the plan D on your difficult airway algorithm. And <clears throat> even in this time was after your ultrasound was ready to go and turn on. So most likely when your patient is the setting and going south is not the best moment to do this procedure. However, what's, going, what's being advocated right now that will be that we should move and use the cricotile membrane identification as a pre-procedure evaluation, part of our error evaluation before we start the airway management on the patients. This should be done in, in, <clears throat> in patients that we um, identify that we might have any, any difficult uh, during the airway management. And this could be done uh, when we go see the patient in the, the pre-procedure area just a few minutes before the before the, the, the surgery starts. And I would say that maximum two minutes we need after you have competencies in this technique. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so this is the <clears throat> second topic that we're going to talk is the confirmation of endotracheal intubation by ultrasound. <clears throat> so we have, we have a really good um, literature support on this technique to the point that we have at least three systematic reviews and meta-analysis on the topic. <clears throat> and these meta-analysis were, they were, they made, sorry, they were made in the emergency department and ICU setting. And I would say that <clears throat> this technique <clears throat> maybe will not be so interesting for anesthesiologists because we have the majority of our patients <clears throat> in a controlled environment and they are most of the time stable. But when you look into the position that our colleagues at ED and ICU, they are when they manage airway, the things are not so white and, and black. <clears throat> so I believe that this will be a technique that they could uh, certainly use to confirm <clears throat> that the patients are uh, uh, had endotrach intubation. And all these <clears throat> meta-analysis, we found a good number of patients, even when we're 2,500, <clears throat> They show that the, for this technique, we have a sensitivity above 
and then specific, specificity ab above 84%. So it's a really, really reliable <coughs> um, uh, technique. So I just want to show you what we could see on this technique. So if you look first to the image on the left, <coughs> you're going to see an image and the bigger rounded area with the air interface again, so that will be the upper yellow arrow, you have the trachea. <clears throat> and on the lower yellow arrow, you can see the esophagus with the outside and inside layers. And you can see that is a, a collapsed structure. So this is a very good image. It's always challenging to see the esophagus, but here is really clear that's there. When you look into the, the middle image, you can sometimes you're going to have the bullet sign when you have the endotracheal tube into the trachea. So that means that you're going to have a really uh, firm uh, shadow because the endotracheal tube is there and you have this bullet sign. <clears throat> but the most important image here will be the one on the right side because here we have an image from for esophageal intubation, okay? <clears throat> and this is what we call the double track image, the double track sign. <clears throat> so what you have here <clears throat> on the left part, you actually have like your bigger rounded structure, that's the trachea with the air, airway, uh, sorry, the air interface. So you have the bright lines, <clears throat> but you have another image a little bit lower in the center, also with air interface. So that means this is the esophagus with the endotracheal tube inside. <clears throat> and because you have air inside the endotracheal tube, you have air interface there. So that means that you have the double track sign and this is an esophageal intubation. <clears throat> um, uh, this, this technique, despite have a high accuracy as we see in the systematic reviews, <clears throat> there is a, a pivot, there is a, a backlash. If your esophagus is <clears throat> below the trachea, then you're not going to be able to use this technique. However, we have confirmation from other studies, uh, a few studies actually on uh, the, uh, how cricoid pressure changes the positions, but doing MRIs in healthy patients without cricoid pressure, you can see that the majority of times, esophagus is actually on the left of the trachea, left the posterior part of the trachea, and only a few percentage of them will be just <clears throat> uh, posteriorly to, to the, the trachea. The next uh, technique that I would like to, to, to talk about, and, and in this presentation, I'm doing like from the, the one that we have more uh, literature support, is more well documented in literature, the one that's less, <clears throat> the, the next one <clears throat> will be they use the ultrasound guided percutaneous tracheostomy. <clears throat> Despite this technique also would be a technique that would be maybe use it, probably use it more from our IC colleagues, but I would say that uh, would be a technique that anesthesiologists will have like facility to use because it mainly reproduces what we do when we're doing like a central line or when we're doing a regional anesthesia block. <clears throat> so on the top two images, this is how, what they call the uh, out of plane technique. <clears throat> so in the middle of the image, you can see again a rounded structure, that's the trachea. And if you look into the image on the top left, um, letter C, <clears throat> you're going to see above the trachea, a dot, a white dot. And this is actually the, the, the tip of your needle. <clears throat> So what you need to do, you just follow the tip of your needle until it reaches a trachea with your ultrasound beam. <clears throat> At the bottom, both images, you can see actually all your needle because you're doing an in-plane approach. And then <clears throat> again, you can see on the left uh, bottom, uh, the image under letter E, you can see a line that comes from the top left end of the image and goes all the way until it touches the trachea. <clears throat> so these are both uh, techniques that you can use for uh, percutaneous tracheostomy guided by ultrasound. <clears throat> and 
the thing that we want, need to be in mind, the, the, the limitation of this technique is that once you enter the trachea, <clears throat> because you have air interface and you cannot look into the air with the ultrasound, what happens is <clears throat> uh, you cannot uh, see the tip of the needle. You cannot see the wire that introduced because normally we will use like a, a cell decant technique and you cannot see even like the tracheostomy tube balloon. So this is a, a limitation of the technique. In terms of literature, we have uh, first, the first study on the top uh, left is a comparison about like doing it with, uh, by palpation with ultrasound. And it showed <clears throat> that uh, uh, this students show lower perioperative complications with ultrasound guided technique, 7.8% to 15%. However, it was a small study, so there was no statistical significance. But the, there was a lower number of multiple attempts in the ultrasound group, and this was like 4% to 13% and was statistically significant. <clears throat> the second study <clears throat> at the bottom is a comparison of three techniques, the uh, in-plane, out-plane, out-of-plane, and uh, palpation techniques. And <clears throat> the out-of-plane technique had fewer punctures, lower complications, and higher first entry success. <clears throat> this is another <clears throat> study comparing then ultrasound to bronchoscopy guided percutaneous tracheostomy. And <clears throat> it showed that the rate of failure was this equal between both groups, despite the number of minor complications being a little bit higher in the ultrasound. Uh, guided technique, 32% to 20% also was not statistically significant. So uh, ultrasound guided percutaneous might be as safe as bronchoscopy one. <clears throat> and now <clears throat> I just want to spare a few minutes uh, talking about prediction of difficult airway by ultrasound. That's the, 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 the topic that was like, this is the hot topic right now. And um, there are many, many studies that ca came out in the last years about how to predict uh, difficult laryngoscopy, difficult intubation, or difficult bag mass ventilation by ultrasound. <clears throat> and there are many, many parameters that have been studied, uh, above uh, around 28, actually. Uh, so this is mainly how we do, is the, in the submandibular space that we're going to do the measurements. You can do also, on, can, as you can see on the left, uh, longitudinal approach. And here you can see a few parameters like uh, high mental distance, um, tongue thickness, um, um, the, 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 um, sorry, the, the, the height of your, your tongue as well. And the other side, you, you can use like the transverse approach to see how the tongue cross-sectional area, for example. So these will be the two approaches. And there are so many, so many small studies on that. This is a limitation. Several small studies that actually had like two systematic reviews, a meta-analysis published on this topic already, one in 2021 and one now in April 2022. Uh, and these, these two uh, systematic reviews, they show that the, the parameter that was most studied and seems more promising right now will be the distance from skin to epiglottis. <clears throat> However, all these, these the, 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 both meta-analyses agree that the studies are low to very low quality of evidence and there is a high heterogeneity between the studies. And why is that? Because we have so many parameters and the way that the studies are done, they check uh, the parameters by ultrasound they, they make the airway management, then they divided the patients into the easy category and difficult category by the airway management, and then they review the parameters. So the number of the difficult airways, of course, are much smaller. <clears throat> In this meta-analysis from analgesia and analgesia, um, they went a little bit further and they said uh, that um, because the, the cutting off uh, measurements they are not well defined. So this is a barrier to understand how this is, can be used. Uh, but they went on this systematic review above and they said from the distance from skin to epiglottis, maybe two to above two or 2.5 centimeters might be an indication of difficult laryngoscopy. So more studies will definitely come on, on that. 
and I think is promising, but we need to, to wait a little bit more to have more precise indications on that. And that's all that I have to talk about. Thank you very much again for the opportunity and I'm open to any questions at, at the end of the session. I'm going to stop sharing now.